Good afternoon. Hello. How you doing? You feeling good? Doing okay? A little cloudy outside. That's okay, right? I know. Who cares? That's what I'm thinking. So my name is Chris Della Torre, and I host a radio program for CBC called Afternoon Drive from your small but mighty CBC London station down the street. Yes. Public broadcasting. We are still around, folks. So it's a pleasure for me to be here today as your, as your host, as we welcome two very, very bright lights in, in Canada's literary scene. They both released new books recently, and I am very thrilled to have them both with us, both to read from their books and to discuss them as well. So shall we meet our authors? You, you know who they are anyway. You already know. So Lynn Cody is, uh, she's been an acclaimed author since publishing her first novel, really, in her late 20s, which became a finalist for the Governor General's Literary Award. And of course, her 2013 short story collection, How Going, took home the Scotiabank Giller Prize. Her latest is a suspense novel. It's called Watching You Without Me. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Lynn Cody. <laughs> Now, we also have the pleasure of meeting, uh, having another award-winning novelist and poet with us. Uh, he's written two award-winning books of poetry, Anatomy of Keys and Omens in the Year of the Ox. He's written three novels as well. By Gaslight was long-listed for the 2016 Giller, and his latest is Lampedusa. It's on the 2019 Scotiabank Giller Prize shortlist. Please welcome Stephen Price, everybody. How are you guys doing? Doing all right? You can use these. Oh, sorry, I should have told you. Bad hosting. The mics are for our use. I assumed. Yeah. <laughs> so you can use those. And of course, if you want to read, you also have the option of the podium as well. It's, uh, it's really up to you. And, and thank you, both of you, for coming today. Appreciate it. Thank you. So uh, you both have had really incredible careers so far. So just as a way for us to get to know you, you know, I'd like to ask each of you about your, your beginnings as writers. So, so Lynn, do you remember the moment that you made the decision to own the title of being a writer? Um, well, okay, I can remember two distinct moments uh, in, in my youth when I thought maybe this is something I could do. And one was in grade four when um, I had this really great teacher who, you know, read, read us Judy Bloom and all these really great young adult novels, um, and uh, I like to write stories, and so sometimes there would be, you know, there would be an assignment to write, write a piece of fiction, and um, I would always, you know, get really into it, and then I would get up and read my stories to the classroom, and my classmates would get really into it, too, and so that was, that was the first instance of getting some validation for what I was writing, which is so important. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and I just remember on one of these occasions, as I sat down, my teacher, Mrs. Jones, said, maybe one day we'll have a book by Lynn on our shelves. <laughs> and that was the first time I went, oh, this is something people can do. Yeah. This is something I could do. There's people out there who are writers, and she's saying maybe I could be one. Um, and nobody had ever you know, said I could be any particular <laughs> profession before that. And then um, later on, when I was in my 20s, and I, you know, I, I wrote ever since, and I, since that moment in grade four, and I, like the idea of you know writing, but I didn't really know what it was to be a writer, um, or like how it worked as a profession, as a way of making a living. Right. You know, I'm soon to discover that it's really a way of making a living, but it, but it is a profession. Um, but I was writing and writing, and I, I was doing this job, this sort of nominal summer job um, that you know my dad's connections of, had got me in Cape Breton. Um, working for the Children's Aid Society. And it was, it was a great job, but it was a student job, and so they just kind of would have me filing and, and um, typing up letters and stuff like that. Um, and there really wasn't enough work for me, so they just stuck me in a back office with a typewriter, because there were typewriters back then, um, and I would write stories, because it looked and sounded like I was working. <laughs> And that was, you know, that was the first summer I, I spent really devoting myself to, to writing. Um, and I just thought I could do this. This is something I could, I could do and, and keep doing. <laughs> Did they ever find out what you were really doing back there? They, they didn't care what I was doing back there. It was just a summer grant. So. That early teacher you had in grade four, does she know what 
you know, became of you, so to speak? She does actually, because I, I told the story um, on the radio at a certain point, and I heard from her daughter, and her daughter told me that her mother had heard it on the radio. Oh, that's, really that's, that's so great. Uh, Stephen, at what point did you realize that you were being called to be a storyteller, be it a poet or a novelist or, or some kind of person that tells stories? Yeah, I um, I was a kid. I was I was a, I was a, I was a boy. I was a solitary boy. Um, I this was long before the internet, and I grew up in a small town called Colwood, outside of Victoria, on Vancouver Island, on the West Coast. Um, and it was a little bit rough back then. Uh, and you know, like the the bigger kids, the bigger boys would pick on the smaller the smaller boys, uh, and then the smaller boys would pick on me. <laughs> so I really didn't have a lot of um, friends. Uh, I had two brothers, and we were close, close to family. Um, but books, I, I read books. It was a way of keeping my head down, uh, a way of, of trying to not be seen. But it was also a way of finding um, a common spirit. You know, like uh, my companions lived in books. Uh, and it was in grade six that I had a remarkable teacher, Mr. Balchin, uh, who changed my life, um, who encouraged reading, uh, encouraged me. Um, introduced me to several books that meant a lot to me at the time. Uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's Source of Urgency was one. The Weird Stone of Brazilian was another one. Sort of um, what we call YA books now, but back then they didn't have a name. Right. Um, and they, they were remarkable to me, and they, they moved me, and I didn't understand them. And I think it was the not understanding them that um, made them stay with me at the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, I. I I'd love it if each of you told us a bit about your novels, and uh, if you read from each of them as well. Lynn, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll, I'll just start by telling you that you're on yeah. the podium. Is that how the order? Yeah, it looks to that, sure. Okay. Um, well, it's a uh, story from the point of view of Karen, who's a woman in her 40s, and she has to come home to um, her mother's house in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, uh, because her mother is sort of suddenly died, and um, Karen has to figure out, you know, she's got to see where her mother's affairs, but she also has to figure out what to do with her older sister, Kelly, who's developmentally disabled, and Karen's mother, Irene, has always looked after Kelly as, as if she were a child, because um, that's, that's where her cognitive level is. Um, and so Karen is, when, when we meet her, she's just kind of awash in, in grief and the fog of having lost her mother, and also feeling overwhelmed um, by Kelly and her needs. Uh, and you know, her mother has a system in place, and she's got care workers coming in regularly, so Karen's got to figure out the schedule. Um, and there's this one care worker who's a man. The rest of them are women, but there's this one guy who's a man who takes Kelly for walks, and his name is Trevor. Um, and he's really familiar with Kelly. He really knows the house. In fact, he has a key to the house that Karen's mother apparently gave him. Um, and so he, he lets himself in, and uh, it's like it's like he owns the place, in a way. And at, at first, you know, Karen is a bit troubled by this, but he's so great with Kelly, and he's so helpful. He's And Karen is in need of a lot of help at this point. Um, and Trevor wants to help her, and it turns out that he was a great help to her mother when she was she was sick and getting older. Um, and so because Karen feels so guilty about you know, not looking after her mother, not, not kind of being there at the end of her mother's life, she's, um, she kind of lets Trevor in a little bit more than she would if she was thinking clearly. Right. <coughs> I'll take it on over to yes. William now. So I actually decided to read um, from a point in the end of the novel, and it, it's kind of the novel's climax. So it's it's a wee bit spoilery, but not too much. <laughs> um, but I will say, I just have to tell you a couple of things. So, so it gets to the point where Trevor kind of is in the house and he won't leave, and because Karen is worried about her sister Kelly, she can't she can't necessarily bolt out of the house to get away from him because that still leaves Kelly there and Kelly's 250 pounds and she doesn't, you know, she doesn't move quickly or much at all if she doesn't have to. Um, and so at this point, Karen's been kind of trapped in the house with Trevor and things have come to a head. He 
kicked a glass across the floor and it shattered and then the dishwasher broke in the middle of a big argument they were having and, and then he stepped on some glass and his foot started bleeding and then Karen just got fed up with the fact of him being there and started breaking dishes and screaming, leave, leave. Um, and so in the midst of all this, the doorbell rings. And um, it's, it's, I'll just tell you, it's a neighbor at the door named Noel. And uh, Noel kind of plays into the story earlier in that he, there's a break in, or there's some vandalism that happens on Karen Street a, a little earlier in the novel. And, and Noel is kind of almost this comic relief kind of character. He's a retiree, and he's, he's mad because he wanted to get his shotgun out and, and chase the vandals away, but he couldn't find the combination to the, his, the case where he, he keeps his shotgun, so he was, he was really angry about that, and that's kind of all Karen knows about Noel, who lives next door. So the doorbell rings, bing bong. Trevor wanted me to answer it this time. At first, I didn't understand why. I thought it might be because he didn't want to hobble down the stairs on his cut foot. Or maybe he was trying to keep up appearances, intuiting that if a strange man was the only one ever seen coming to the door of Irene Petrie's house, well-meaning neighbors might ask questions. At any rate, I was to go down and answer the door. And Trevor Wood, he said, be right here, leaning in the kitchen doorway where he could keep an eye on Kelly. This position had the added benefit of blocking the view of the kitchen from down there. The broken glass and white jagged plate fragments covering the floor like a layer of splintered bones. I swept my eyes across this glinting carpet before heading down the stairs, kind of amazed. Who had done that? Me? I had a feeling like I'd just been shaken awake. That's when I understood why Trevor had sent me to answer the door, because he knew if he hadn't, I would have kept going, would have yanked open the cupboard door the moment he stepped away and kept right on smashing plates. I went down the stairs wondering how I looked. Trevor hadn't told me to straighten myself up, so maybe I wasn't as mad-eyed and disheveled as I felt. Then again, the doorbell kept ringing and perhaps Trevor was unnerved. Maybe he just wanted me to get down there and make it stop. Noel was carrying a clipboard. Oh, how you doing? he said when I pulled open the door, looking up from it at me over his bifocals. Good, Noel. Hi, I said, thinking, see me. Didn't catch you folks in the middle of your supper, I hope. No, no, I said. We just finished. I tried to time it that way. Noel waved the clipboard at me apologetically. Hate this door-to-door -door BS, but folks along the street here are usually nice enough to put up with it once a year, anyhow. I stared at him, trying to understand why Noel would be selling something door to door. Raffle season, he said. Raffle season? For the hospital. Lions Club holds it every year. Your mom always liked to put in. It took me what felt like a very long time to decipher these words. Are you, I said slowly, a lion? Noel closed his eyes and nodded. I am a lion, he said. He said this in a serene way that struck me as out of character. I was used to seeing Noel fired up, face in a pissed off knot, ready to fight. Going on about 30 years, it pains me to say. He glanced up at Trevor, a neutral glance of casual dislike, obligatory acknowledgement. How's it going? Good, good, said Trevor. Noel turned back to me. He was a big man. I'd noticed it before, had assumed his size was what made him so pugnacious. I figured Noel was a man who had gotten used during his young manhood to being intimidating. He'd never had to develop debating skills or learn to negotiate assholes like the rest of us. He plowed through the bullshit of life, as was the prerogative of the large and muscular. But he was old now, living the soft, lawnmower-riding life of a retiree, putting on weight, only going outside to putter in his yard. He wore bifocals and had a bad hip or knee, whatever it was that gave him that limp. Noel coughed. Um, I said, what did my mother usually give? It's a raffle, Noel repeated patiently. You could win a house. Tickets are $50. I grabbed my purse off the coat rack just as I had fantasized about doing moments before. But I don't want another house, I thought distantly. <laughs> the house I have is killing me. Above us, Trevor couldn't help himself. $50, he said wonderingly. Jesus, Murphy. 
Noel flicked his eyes up to Trevor, his features flattening into hostile neutrality again. For a house, he repeated, to help the hospital. <laughs> I had my wallet in my hand and stood there staring into it. I don't have $50, I said, and what I could hear was a fretful, almost panicked voice, because I didn't know how to do this. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. This was an opportunity, but I had no idea how to take advantage of it. Noel turned back to me, his face kind, and for the first time since I'd known him, fatherly. I can just take your credit card number, dear. Oh boy, yelped Trevor from above us. Someone's on his way to Fiji. Noel's face contracted into the pissed off knot I was familiar with, and he jerked it up at Trevor to retort something sharp. But then he noticed something. Foot's bleeding there, buddy. I glanced up at Trevor. He'd been leaning against the door frame, balancing all his weight on his left foot in order to avoid putting any on his right. But now the bottom of his right sock was soaked through with blood. Arse, remarked Trevor, glancing down at his foot. We broke a glass, I explained to Noel. Okay, said Noel, watching with something like contentment as Trevor, wincing, leaned against the fridge and pulled off his sock. She got some polysporin or something on that. Trevor was already reaching above the fridge where he apparently knew Irene had kept the first aid kit since Kelly and I were kids. His face was twisted in irritation at Noel's advice. It was clear Noel rubbed Trevor the wrong way every bit as much as Trevor did Noel. They were two snarling alphas, like the dogs who'd had to be scolded and pulled apart on the sidewalk earlier that afternoon. But before Trevor could snarl a remark at Noel, a pot fell out of the cupboard and hit him in the face. This happened with a combination of speed and surprise that felt surreal to me in the moment. It was only later that I registered this surreal quality was comedy. That is, the pot had comic timing. It even made a sound like bonk <laughs> as it bounced off the bridge of Trevor's nose. He shouted in pain, doubled over, and just as he was about to straighten up again, another pot and a lid fell out as if they'd somehow been teetering there, biding their time. It was the same thing that had happened to me when I was cleaning up the kitchen, and I couldn't quite comprehend how it could be happening a second time. The pots bounced off the back of his head and upper shoulders, and Trevor howled again, and I knew I had been given another chance. I turned to Noel. Can you go get your shotgun? Thank you. Lynn Cody. So good. I like Noel so much. He's, 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 <laughs> You know, he just it's like, but as you said, about being able to plow through the bullshit of life is an incredible quality. And also, you know, he just he cuts the tension so well in the in the story. But I just love how you're able to to write something that's, you know, it's scary. You know, the, the book is is heartfelt felt elsewhere, and it's also so funny. Like it's just hilarious. Thank you. Like, to, how conscious are you of, of creating a tone or a mood while you're? while you're writing the story? I mean, pretty conscious. It's, it's gratifying to hear you say it's funny because when I was writing it, I felt like this is not funny at all. <laughs> In fact, it's probably the least funny of my novels. Um, and I do kind of try to imbue my novels with you know, humor because I, you know, that's fun. I find that you know, a fun thing to, to read, even in the most serious novel. You've mm -hmm. got, you got to have a bit of humor in there. Um, but so much, so much of the subject matter felt very heavy to me when I was writing it because so much of it is about Karen's guilt and the death of her mother and her mother's prolonged illness and mortality and growing older. Um, and it was all stuff that just felt like, when I was writing, felt like a bit of a slog. And so I was, I was you know, really insecure a lot of the time when I was writing because I was thinking, who's going to want to read this? I don't know if I'm going to want to read this. I'm not enjoying writing it right now. Um, but I guess what saved it for me was thinking about tone and thinking about how to you know, offset that, that heaviness and, and the sad stuff, because I think the sad stuff is there. Um, and for me, it was, it was sort of, it was imbuing it with humor when I could, but it was also, uh, more deliberately, I think it was also making it the suspense novel it is. And that's sort of thinking about the structure 
and keeping you know the suspense very tight yeah. and um, making sure that you know there's there's a constant questions in the reader's mind that just keeps them turning the pages and want to know what happens next. Right. That's so, so, so interesting. interesting. I know we talked about this a little bit on the radio, but you know the novel could have just been about you know this successful lawyer from Toronto coming back home, grieving her mother and then taking care of her sister and the, the change within that person from being someone who's focused on himself to someone who's focused on their family. But then there's this whole other curveball with Trevor, yeah. the caregiver, who is just such an invasive and, and terrible person. I mean, who, who is he? Like, who inspired Trevor? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get asked that a lot. Who is Trevor? Who is this guy? Um, but, you know, my answer is, I in all of my books, there's, I, this is going to make it sound very simplistic, but in all my books I have found, looking back, there's always a figure who basically represents the patriarchy in some form or another. Um, and I, in my books, it's usually a working class version of the patriarchy, as, as it is with Trevor. So it's not, you know, a rich cat cat, fat cat businessman. Or it's usually like a, it's usually like a little maritime boy who's who enjoys the sort of traditional virtues of manhood, like being, you know, being strong and being competent and mowing the lawn and, you know, look, looking after, looking after women, um, which sounds very benign. And so, and that's, um, and Trevor kind of ends up being the worst possible version of that. So he's, you know, I, I have a lot of um, kind of quote unquote bad man characters or, or bad father kind of characters. Um, Isidore in Saints of Big Heart where it's one, he's like an uncle and he's just like, he's really overbearing and, and he sort of oppresses his, um, but uh, Trevor is like probably the darkest I've ever met in depicting that kind mm -hmm. of man. Mm -hmm. You talked about how so much of the process of writing was very unenjoyable for you. Um, when, when you're writing a story, um, how often do you feel that level of, I really don't enjoy this, and how does that affect the outcome? Well, very rarely for me, and that's, that's why I was so insecure about this book. Because um, I actually used to, when I when I taught and when I mentored other writers, and they would come to see me and they would be sort of moaning about how hard it was <laughs> to write their, their manuscripts, um, I would, you know, I was always say this hard-ass kind of thing, which was, well, if you're not enjoying it, I don't think you should do it. Because, you know, there's not a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow when it comes to <laughs> being a Canadian writer, necessarily. Like, if the process is its own reward, and um, getting published is great, but there's no guarantee. So I, I just feel like if you're not enjoying the process, I'm not sure why anyone would do it. So, and then here I was not enjoying the process. Yeah. Um, but you know, what I did to uh, get myself through that was, at my lowest point, I just stopped and I asked myself, okay, is there anything here you like? Is there anything here that makes you happy and that you feel good about? Mm -hmm. And the answer was actually Kelly, the character yeah, Kelly. Sister, yeah. I, I just loved her, and I loved the way she was coming out on the page, and I felt really good about who she was and her relationship with Karen. Mm. And she was partly inspired by your uncle, is that right? Yeah, yeah. My, my uncle is developmentally disabled in, in the same way Kelly is, and, um, and and really distinctive. Like he's got a lot of a lot of just distinctive <laughs> actions and speech patterns and quirks um, that you just don't see, you know your average person <laughs> performing. Um, and so I, I wanted to capture that that uniqueness, that sort of originality of character. Mm -hmm. So I so I was inspired by a lot of what he does and says. Yeah. So aside from the, the suspense part of this or the Trevor part of it, I mean what what does the story have to say about what Karen is going through and, and, and both the joy and the burden of of, of really sitting down and, and devoting her life to care for, for Kelly, for another person? I mean, I think what Karen comes to realize by the end of the book is that she's been feeling really bad about her life choices, and she's been feeling sort of, Trevor has made her deeply insecure about, you know, what kind of adult woman she has become, because he's been undermining her this whole time and telling her, yeah, you didn't look after your mother, you didn't look after your sister, you were a bad daughter, a bad sister, you were selfish, and like this is all sort of the subtext of everything Trevor says to her. Mm -hmm. And be, and because she's in the place she's in regarding her grief, um, she's receptive to all that. Yeah. 
And I think when she, when she sort of wakes up from Trevor's gaslighting and starts to reassure, reassert herself again, what she comes to realize is it's not that she did all these things wrong and that she was a bad daughter. What the pr problem was she just, she kind of overcorrected a little bit. Mm. Like, so she didn't want to be like Irene who was, who was a devoted caregiver and gave her life over to it and sacrificed her own ambitions and desires. And so she just like said, I'm gonna stay the hell away from this household and I'm never gonna look after anybody. I'm not gonna be responsible for any, anybody. Yeah. And um, Karen comes to understand that, I just, that, that was a bit extreme, <laughs> ultimately. <laughs> and you know what? I've been here with Kelly for a month and she finds herself enjoying looking after Kelly and understanding, you know, the joy that her own mother took in it. And she just realizes, you know, her mother was a bit extreme too. Like she didn't have to erase her whole life to look after her daughter. And mm -hmm. maybe there's a happy medium that can be found. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Lynn. Lynn Cody, everybody. Thank you. All right. So we'll come back to Lynn in a minute. Stephen, how are you? I'm good. Doing good. <clears throat> Right. Well, we're so great, lucky to have you here, and and we'd love to hear about Lampedusa. Do you want to handle the setup, or do you want me to give you a, a setup to the setup? <laughs> well, then I, I'm, now I'm curious about setup to the setup. Um, well, basically, I, I the truth of it is, so so both Stephen and Lynn were on the radio show earlier this week, and I have my notes from the radio show, so I'm kind of cheating. I could I could read the uh, the intro. <laughs> well, I, and I I bring this up because Lampedusa, I think requires a lot, a bit more setup because it's a novel about, in a, uh, in a way, uh, about an actual novel that exists. So do you want? Well, I, I, I can introduce this, no trouble. Uh, sure, sure. Yeah. You're probably um, better at it than me because it is your book. <laughs> um, and then shall I read from it as, as well? Sure. You, okay. Yeah. There's so many options here. Sit there, sit here, use this mic, use that mic. What have most people been doing? Have most people been going to the podium to read? Just curious. Testing? Oh, look at that. Um, yeah, uh, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, first of all, it's such a pleasure to be here. I really like London. Uh, some of my favorite people live in London, uh, so it's nice to be back here. Um, even if only briefly. And I just got in a couple hours ago and I'm, I'm leaving again tomorrow morning. Um, sometimes books grow out of other books. And this novel, Lampedusa, is one such for me. Uh, 20 years ago, when I was an aspiring writer, I first read this very strange novel called The Leopard. Now it's not, it doesn't look very strange at first. It's, uh, it's a novel that was first published in 1959. It's set in the 1860s in Sicily. Some of you might be familiar with it. Some of you might be familiar with the movie that was made out of it in 1962, starring Burt Lancaster and Claudia Cardinale and Alain Delon. Uh, it's an exquisite, beautiful movie. Yeah, the leopard tells the story of a Sicilian prince, Don Fabrizio, Prince of Selina. And it's set, it, it opens on the day that Garibaldi is landing in Sicily. Garibaldi is unifying Sicily, unifying Italy, sorry. He's creating the first, uh, helping to create the first unified Italy in history since the Roman Empire. It's called, a period called the Risorgimento. It's a very important period of transition for Italy because it's the time at which the aristocracy, the feudal aristocracy, the Don Fabrizios of the world are losing their power and this old world, this old aristocracy, is giving way to this proto-democracy, the rise of the middle class. And in Lampedusa's novel, The Leopard, he follows Don Fabrizio, who's an extremely charismatic, powerful man. As, he, as his own powers are waning, as he's getting older, uh, and he's beginning to recognize his own mortality, he follows him through this, these changing decades as his entire world is also losing its power and giving way to this new world. So it's a kind of a melancholy novel. But when I read it 20 years ago, when I was an aspiring writer, was, I was in the writing department at UVic, um, and it was kind of a book that was being passed around, kind of like a secret or a rumor uh, from hand to hand with the students there. Uh, what struck me was the 
strange shape of the book. It was built in a very peculiar way. Time moves very strangely through the book. It speeds along very quickly, and then suddenly it'll, it'll just creep along, uh, and then you'll leap along across, say, three months or two years, and then you'll creep along again. It's a very, very unusual book. There's nothing like it in, in Canadian letters. And as a 20-year-old who'd grown up in Colwood on the West Coast and who was studying writing in, here in North America, I didn't know what to make with this book. It was very, very, it felt remote, it felt severe, it felt unusual, and I put it aside. Uh, and I just continued on. And then five years later, I came back to the book and I read it again, this novel, The Leopard. And I found myself moved by it again, but in a different way. It felt like a slightly different book to me. And when I read it again five years later, again, it felt like a different book. I was taking different things from it, which I like to think is, is the definition of a masterpiece. It's a book that grows with you and changes with you as you change. And you can always find new things in it. Now, it's not the novel that I've reread most in my life. And it's not the novel that I love the most in my life, but it's a novel that I've never really figured out how it works. There's this mystery at its center, the way it's built, that, that completely baffles me as a writer and as a reader. And so I find myself, I continually go back to it. Well, in the prefaces to The Leopard, uh, and in the forewords and the afterwards to the various English editions, they always describe Lampedusa, its author, as a man who, he was a dilettante, he was a, 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 a prince, he was the prince of Lampedusa, uh, living in Palermo. And he's a person, they say, who did nothing with his life for his entire life, he did very little. And then at the end of his life, in the last two years, he sat down and he wrote this book. And the legend is, and this is a, it's a true legend, so it's, it's not really a legend, but the, the famous story is that he wrote this novel after dreaming of writing it for 25 years, and then he sent it out to get published as he was growing more and more ill, and it was rejected. And then he sent it out a second time, and it was rejected a second time, and he died 10 days later, believing the book was a failure, believing that it would never be published. A year after his death, the novel is published, it wins the Strega Prize, which is Italy's Pulitzer Prize, it sells three million copies, it's never been out of print, it's considered the greatest Italian novel of the century, a classic of world literature. It's still in print in English and Italian and dozens of other languages, et cetera, and so forth. And of course, it was turned into a gorgeous, very important film by Visconti. But Lampedusa, Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa, never knew any of that. He died leaving a letter behind for his adopted son and his wife saying, please try to continue to get my novel published, but under no circumstances do I want you to pay for it. I want it published by what he would call then a real publisher. And that story is kind of heartbreaking. Well, a couple of years ago, I came across a biography written in English by an academic named David Gilmore that talked about Lampedusa's life. And it's the, it's the only thing out there in English that, that's available. And in fact, there's very little in Italian, too, uh, despite its, its prominence there. And the first thing that struck me was that his life was not so boring after all. He lived in a remarkable life, an incredible life. And I mean, I, I won't tell you everything in it because you'll have to read the novel to find out, but I'll give you a little taste. He was the son of Beatrice Couto. He was born in the 1890s. And Beatrice Couto is one of the five famous Couto sisters in Palermitan society. They were five beautiful, charismatic, modern women. They were, they were educated in what was called the Continental Manor or the French Manor, which really just meant that they thought for themselves and they refused to fall into line in the proper and polite way. So they, that led, of course, to scandals and, and much talk of the town, and et cetera, and so forth. Now, those five sisters, because they, were, they, were, they, were, they weren't very many young women educated like them and, and who thought the way they did, they were, they were very, very close, and they were very prominent in society. And Beatrice was the most charismatic and the most powerful, if you want to think of them as powerful, Woman, women of, of, of all the sisters. And Giuseppe, being, being her, her only son, very much lived under her shadow. Now, when he was still a young boy, three of those sisters died in tragic circumstances. One of them was murdered by a lover in a hotel room, and uh, the scandal of that, because it was a public scandal, led to another one committing suicide in shame because she was the only unmarried sister. Beatrice, never got over the loss of these three sisters. The tragedy was too, too great for her. And that changed 
who she was. And that, of course, changed who her still very young son was and who he grew up to be. In the First World War, a few years after this, Giuseppe Tomasi enlists. He fights in the Asanzo campaign. He's taken prisoner. He's, he, he goes to a prisoner of war camp in Hungary. He escapes from the camp. He's captured. He's beaten. He's returned to the camp. He escapes a second time. And he makes his way across a war-torn landscape all the way back to Italy, just in time for the armistice to be signed. He would have been released anyways. That was very poor luck. Nevertheless, very interesting. He spends the 1920s dealing with what he witnessed in the war, traveling the great capitals of Europe, seeing the, the most famous jazz clubs in, in the great capitals, seeing going to Paris, London, et cetera, and so forth. And at the end of the 1920s, he gets secretly married to a Latvian countess, secretly married because he is too scared of his mother to tell her that he's going to get married. So he writes around the morning of the marriage from Latvia saying, I'm thinking of getting engaged. <laughs> Obviously, the, his, his new wife and, and his mother don't get along too well, so he spends the next decade living apart from his wife. And they, they have a marriage in which it's conducted just through, through correspondence. In the Second World War, the Americans bomb all of the properties in Palermo that belong to Giuseppe Tomasi's family. And his, all of his family wealth, which had been dissipating already, is gone entirely. And by the 1950s, which is when my novel opens, in the last two years of his life, he is, as his adopted son said to me when I was in Sicily and I got to meet him, he is a man completely in despair, a man who has lost everything. So he's an impoverished Sicilian prince. He's going to be the last prince of Lampedusa because he has no biological children. And he's living with his wife, Alessandra, in Palermo, in an impoverished, run-down palazzo overlooking the sea. And that's where this novel opens. Wow. I know, what a life. Isn't that fascinating? And yet, if you read these forewords and these prefaces, they say he's somebody who did nothing with his life until he wrote this book. And part of what interested me was that when I did read this biography and I got to the part where it's talking about the last two years of his life in which he writes this novel, what I realized is you could take the sequence of events that he lived through in those two years, the journeys he went on, the people he was meeting, the struggles he was having, and you could lift them up. And if you remember, I said the leopard is built in this very strange way, this strange structure. You could lift them up and lay it on top of the strange structure of the leopard. And it, the, the pieces fit almost perfectly. And when I saw that, like a palimpsest, and when I saw that, I could see a novel there. And it seemed to be saying something very interesting to me about art and life and how the one grows out of the other. And that's, that's in essence, the, the book that, that's been built here. I'm just going to read to you from the opening. In his smaller library, he kept a broken white rock, like a twist of coral, taken by a sugar merchant from the natural harbor at Lampedusa. In the afternoons, he would hold that rock to the sunlight, feeling the sharp, heavy truth of it. He was that island's prince, but like all its princes, had never seen its shores, nor set foot upon it. To visitors, he would say, Riley, it is an island of fire at the edge of the world. Who could live there? He would not add, a great family's bitterness is always lived in. He would not hold that rock out and say, this is a dead thing, and yet it will outlive me. He was the last of his line, and after him came only extinction. In the years since the Americans had swept the island, he had lived with his wife, Alessandra, in one half of a small palazzo in the medieval quarter of Palermo, on the narrow Via Butera, their windows glazed and facing the sea. If asked, he would admit it was his house, but not his home. His true home stood behind thick walls several streets away, in a slump of cracked stone and wind-rotted masonry from a bomb born across the Atlantic, a bomb whose sole purpose was the obliteration of the world as it had been. That bomb fell in April 1943, and his wife's estate at Stalmersay, far to the north in Latvia, had been overrun by the Russians in the same month. They had found themselves homeless and orphaned as one. 
He walked now the streets of his city a different man, a man burdened by his losses, not freed by them. For he had been born on a mahogany table in that lost palazzo on Via de Lampedusa, and had slept alone in a small bed in the very room of his birth all throughout his childhood and into his adulthood, and for 10 years even after he was married, and he did not know who he might be without that room to return to. He thought of that often now, in the early light, when he would rise alone and wrap a blanket around his shoulders and tread softly past his wife's bedchamber. His dying mother had returned to the Lampedusa Palazzo after the armistice and lived out her last year in its ruins. His wife held no such attachments to the old world of Palermo. Alessandra Wolf entered a room like a door closing, locking out the light. She was a linguist and reader of literature and the only female psychoanalyst in Italy. And she worked into the night with her patients in their historical library. And he loved her for her mind and for the solitude they shared. Upon meeting her, he had been, he recalled, unable to speak. You will call me Lissy, she had said from the first. He had liked her black hair and blacker eyes and her broad, strong shoulders with the power of a stage soprano in them. From his first glimpse of her in London 30 years ago, when she was still married to her first husband, he had thought her handsome and remote. It amazed him that so much time had passed. He saw in her now the same woman he had seen then, a woman older than he, more worldly, a woman who strode always some feet ahead of him in the street and spoke to him over one shoulder without turning and whose stern grace could be mistaken for arrogance. But there was such tenderness in her. And because she was intelligent, and not classically beautiful. Her opinions had often made her company unbearable to men. And he liked that about her, too. Thank you. Stephen Price. Good to come back to Lisa. Thank you, Stephen. That's so good. So you went to Palermo more than once, is that right? For research? I did. What were you looking for? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I don't know. I mean, on, in some deep metaphysical level, probably um, the same thing that I, I was looking for in the writing of the book, uh, some kind of echo and response. But on a simple level, I was looking for to verify facts and, and, and such. Um, I, I, I went there late in the writing. I'd already written a couple of drafts uh, of, of the novel, so I had a clear idea of the locations I knew what I needed to see. Mm -hmm. And you met Gio, the, the adopted son? I did. I, um, it's a strange thing writing a novel in which you have real people who live uh, in it. Uh, and there's a responsibility that you feel to be um, as true to who, they, who you believe they were or might have been in life. Um, but it's even stranger to include people who are still alive. And, Lampedusa's adopted son, Giochino Lanza Tomasi, uh, is still alive. He's 85 years old and he's living in Palermo. Uh, in fact, he, he lives in Palazzo Via Butera, which is uh, a major location in the novel. And Gio is a, a significant character in my book. He's one of the most important people in, in Lampedusa's life uh, at this point in his life. And so I was very nervous writing this book because I knew he was still alive. And I thought, well, what are the chances that a Sicilian aristocrat will ever even know I'm a Canadian. Who he'll never even know I'm writing this book. Nevertheless, I contacted my my publishers um, here in the U.S. and the U.K. and I said, "No, he's still alive. Should I be nervous?" And they said, "Oh, don't worry. It'll be fine. <laughs> It'll be fine." <laughs> and then when I when I was going to Palermo, I I mentioned it to my American um, publisher, uh, Jonathan Galassi, who's a great translator from the Italian. And poetry and, and so on and so forth, and, um, and sort of a friend to Italian culture. And it turned, he, he, he mentioned, 
oh, I, I, I know Gio Dino. I've known him from his years in New York when he was a cultural attaché in New York for the time, arts and culture. And I thought, oh. Okay. <laughs> and then I flew off to Palermo to Sicily. And I mean, it takes like three, six hours. And then I landed, and there was an email on my phone. You know, I got my phone up and working from Jonathan saying, oh, if you're in Palermo, I just want you to know I, you should absolutely go meet Giacchino. I've already arranged for it. You can meet him on Saturday. I've already <laughs> 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 He'll be in touch with you. He has your number and here's it. I thought, oh my god. <laughs> but then I did. So, uh, I mean, it was, it was also complicated by the fact that, you know, the, the, these Sicilian palazzos, they're huge, huge, and they're very expensive to keep up. And, there are a lot of um, reasonably um, impoverished Sicilian aristocrats who've inherited these houses, and they're kind of these burdens. So one of the ways that some of them make these houses possible, and, and, and this Palazzo di Butera is one of them, is they rent out rooms to travelers. And because I was writing about Di Butera, I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to rent a room and stay there while I'm in Palermo. So I was already staying in Giochino's house when he got in touch with me saying, we should meet up, you should make your way over here. And I had to write him back and say, you know, I'm just down the hall from you. <laughs> like, I had a creepy, really creepy writer. But he, you know, he was, he was so lovely. He was the loveliest man. He was so gracious and generous. Uh, he took me on a long tour of the Palazzo. He described it, because it's all restored. It's gorgeous. If you're ever in Palermo, you should go look at it. He described it for me as it was in the 50s in Lampedusa's day. And it was in total dis disrepair. Of course, uh, from the war, the ceiling had fallen and collapsed, the windows had been blown in by the bombs. Uh, and that, for me, was a big revelation because I had no idea that Lampedusa was as poor as he was in the 50s, uh, which, of course, is not a lovely writing. I heard in another interview you did that uh, he hasn't read the book. Gio hasn't read it, but would you want him to? He has read it. Oh, he has read it? He has. Um, a week after I published it here in Canada, long before it came out in the US, uh, I got an email from him saying he'd read the book. And I thought, it's only been a week ago. Has he really read the book? Or is he just being polite? But he said that, uh, well, so this is kind of a, he's a really lovely, gracious man. And he sent me this very gracious email. Uh, and, and what he said was, and of course, I should say, of course, the novel's called Lampedusa. It inhabits the mind of Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa almost completely. That's the main char the character of the book. And Giacchino is a, very much a secondary character. But when he wrote me this email, he said, uh, it was one of the most convincing portraits he'd ever seen of a young man falling under the sway of a charismatic older, older, older man. As if he was the main character of the book, <laughs> which tickled me very much. I thought it was very charming. <laughs> so, I have to yes. The question was, where, how, how did he become the adop adop adopted son? Well, uh, the short answer is, you should buy the book and read it because it's in the book, and it's so good. Uh, the, no, the, um, well, he, maybe you should buy the book and read it. It's kind of a long story. It's like, it's like a 200 pages long story. <laughs> well, uh, the book, you know, it raises a lot of questions about you know, legacy. And I think yours does too, Lynn. You know, the meaning of how we spend our days, what we're going to leave behind. So how important is, is the idea of legacy in your book, Stephen, especially for Giuseppe, uh, to document his family history before it, it disappears when he dies? But I think that was a big part of, of, of I mean, the mis part of the mystery of the novel is, is why he sat down and wrote it. I mean, if you were diagnosed, given a diagnosis that made you understand that your time on this earth was limited, you only had a brief time left to live. What, what would you do? How would you spend it? Well, Giuseppe Tomasi decided to sit down and write a novel, which I, I think is a very courageous act because, of course, that takes a long time and you need to be able to complete it. And he couldn't be sure that he could live long enough to meet that point. Uh, but I also think it's fascinating that, that, that that's, that's what he chose to devote himself to. He himself was um, acutely aware of the family history of the Tomasi. They, they go back 400 years uh, 
they were granted the princedom of the small island of Lampedusa, which of course is in the views from the Mica crisis now. Uh, but they were also the dukes of, uh, and dukes and duchesses of Palma de Monte Chiaro, which is a small island on, or a small city on Sicily facing the ocean, facing Lampedusa, so facing south. And they were the dukes of that town because they, the Tomasi had been granted the right to found it. They made that town. And it was a rare privilege granted by the King of Naples 400 years ago. And there were some remarkable ancestors, not just the, the ones who founded the town, but there were two saints in Lampedusa's family, um, like Catholic saints. One of them was a nun who uh, was in this cloistered convent in Palma de Monte Chiaro uh, when the devil appeared to her and threw a rock at her head. And the archangel Michael appeared behind her and froze that rock in midair. And then this sainted nun was so, the look on your face that's making me <laughs> smile, was so um, put out by this that she wrote a letter to the devil saying, you shouldn't do such things. Why are you such a bad man? You should be a better person. <laughs> and then the devil wrote back, <laughs> but nobody could understand what the devil wrote because it was in devil language. And when Giuseppe Tomasi went to Palma de Monte Carlo for the first time in his life in 1955, after he was sick, after he'd started writing this book, he got a tour of the convent. And because he was allowed to go in because he was the prince of that, of that city, uh, and he was taken to the cell where his sainted ancestor had, had lived. And the two letters were framed on the wall. I don't know how her letter was there, because it had been mailed to the devil, but it was there. Maybe he returned it with his own. Uh, and he saw the rock. Well, when I went to Palma de Monte Carlo on a research trip, I got into the convent too, because I was being taken on a tour by the deputy mayor of the town. And I got to see the rock as well, because it's still there. And it's this huge, heavy, flat pancake rock. And they didn't really want to tell me what it was, but I was asking through my, you know, I, I kind of knew, I kind of suspected. And then finally they conceded and told me what it was, but the letters are not there anymore. Um, but anyways, Lampedusa lived with the knowledge that there was remarkable people in this history. And he himself felt that he had done nothing. And he had watched when he was born, the Tomasi were still prominent, wealthy, powerful aristocrats. His mother was one of the most famous, beautiful women in, in Palermitan society. And by the time the 1950s had arrived, the Tomasi had become irrelevant. They'd lost all their wealth, they'd lost their property. The world has changed again after the Second World War. It's a different Italy. And he himself felt that he was carrying this great family burden he had failed his family. He had no children. He was, he was the last prince. There would be no more. Uh, and I think writing the book partly was a way for him to reckon with that family and leave something behind since he couldn't leave the title. Mm. Deeply said. So how are we doing for time, guys? You're doing great. So we're doing great? Yeah. Doing great as in? You've got lots. I've got lots. I've got like a gazillion questions. <laughs> well, maybe not that much. <laughs> Um, well, I'll ask you uh, another thing, Stephen, and this will lead to a question for you too, Lynn. Um, so not to manufacture a sense of drama in all of this, but the winner of the Scotiabank Giller Prize, this year's Scotiabank Giller Prize, will be announced in just over two weeks, Monday the 18th. And as we mentioned, uh, Stephen's Lampedusa is a contender this year. And you told me, Stephen, on the radio the other day that literary awards don't play much of a role in your creative process. And I think... That's good. I was glad to hear that, but honestly, though, <laughs> how many times a day are you finding yourself thinking about if you're going to win? Like, as we're getting this close, to me, I, if it were me, it's all I could think about every day. Um, well, uh, when I get questions like this, I find myself thinking about it. Uh, I don't know. Um, six? Six times. That sounds about right. Six times. How, how was it? I mean, Lynn was up twice. How was it? How was it for you? Yeah. What were your days leading up to, you know, the win in 2013 like? Well, like, as Stephen knows, as much as you may not want to think about it, like you're getting questions like this all the time, no, and also I apologize. The, no, no, but also the um, you know the Giller people kind of put you through your paces, and they they send you off to do events and. 
all the events are very fancy, but you're, it's constantly like, Giller Prize, Giller Prize, Giller Prize. <laughs> um, so you really can't think of, of anything anything else during during the months leading up to it, and especially it's November now, so this, this would be sort of, I'm sure you're getting it hardcore right now. Um, but I know that like for my own sanity, uh, I would just tell myself, it's so great to be nominated. Like, wow, that's that's amazing. I'll take that. Yeah. And I, that's where I'm good. My my thinking will stop because yeah. otherwise, you just you know, your stomach acid churns up. And, sure. Yeah. And it would be great to be nominated. I think. And I do feel like we, as in literary fans and also the media, we put a really unfair burden on you guys because mm -hmm. it's all we want to talk about, especially you know now in November as we get close to it. It's like, eh, deal with it. <laughs> So anyway, yeah, on behalf of the media, I apologize for that. No, don't, it's don't, don't. Good. It's, it's, you know, it's lovely. It's really lovely. You know, and one of the best things about it is that it gets the book out um, in front of readers, uh, which is a real gift. It's a, it's a really great opportunity. And, you know, um, I'm acutely aware of the fact that, that the jury is made up of five human beings. And if you were to swap them out for a different jury, uh, they would pick a completely different group of books. Um, so I, I feel very lucky, very fortunate, um, very blessed to be on that list. Um, but I'm also aware that there are so many beautiful novels that were published this year that aren't on the list that, that I hope make their way to readers too. Yeah, yeah and I can, I can confirm that having been on the jury. Um, a lot of it is like, I, I mean, I was going to say Caprice, but it's not like, you know, somebody just sort of pulls a book out of the box and say, I want this one to win. It's not, it's not Caprice in that sense, but it's like, taste is such a divergent thing. And you put five people in a room and it's gonna be all over the map in terms of what people like and what people don't like. And it's true, like we read practically every book of fiction written in Canada that year. And a lot of them were so great. And some of my favorites didn't get on the list. And some of the favorites of, of the other jurors didn't get on the list. So it's all, yeah, it, it, it could be a completely different list from year to year, depending on the jury. Yeah, the idea of crowning the one book, it's almost like a, it's like a flawed system from the beginning, right? Especially when you think about how every author, every story has, they don't all have the same goal. But I think that's why the Giller people are so wonderful in terms of all the lead up, because all that lead up is basically about introducing readers to all the books. That's right. And putting that spotlight on each and every one of them so everybody kind of gets their fair share of the, the attention. Yeah. So this is, uh, as we were talking about earlier, the, the busy season for you guys is just wrapping up. September and October are book tour time. And, you know, the, the, the cycle for an author, to me, for to, to create a story, to refine it, and then finally sort of let it go but in, in the letting go, you're having to do a really dizzying series of interviews and, and book events where you're having to talk about it and talk about it over and over again. I mean, when you're in this stage of it, I mean, after having talked about your book's themes sort of ad nauseum, are you ever struck with, with a fresh or surprising thought about the story that's been in your brain for so long? Yeah, that happened to me just the other day, actually, um, as I was doing something like this, I can't quite remember what the event was now, but I heard myself say, the writing of the book is Karen's process of forgiving herself. Mm. Um, and then I went, I just realized that now, as I said. <laughs> <laughs> That's so great. So it does happen. That's, does that happen to you, Stephen? Yeah, I, I don't, um, the epiphanies don't come from me, though, unfortunately. I'm not, but I, they, usually it's a reader who'll say something that seems amazingly insightful. And I'll be like, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me write that like down for my, my trust book. Who wrote that book? That sounds really good. <laughs> well, this has been so much fun, you guys. Uh, is there any questions do you, from the audience? Does anyone have any questions? Lynn or Stephen? So the, so the question is, why did I write this as a novel and not as a biography? That's a really good question. Um, well, uh, I think it has something to do with the nature of fiction, um, the deep interiority that you get. Uh, I, I don't deceive myself that this is Giuseppe Tomasi de Lampedusa, because he wasn't like. All the facts in the book are scrupulously accurate, researched, and I was very moved that Gio, you know, read it and saw a resemblance in there, uh, both for himself and Lampedusa. But, um, you know, my first book was a book of poems. 
uh, about Harry Bedini, the escape artist. Uh, and it was a poetic biography of, uh, of him. And I had two, two main books to work from. One was a biography of uh, Houdini by a magician called Kenneth Silverman, who really admired Houdini. And the other was a biography of Houdini by Ruth Grandin, who was a professional biographer, and she did not like the man at all. And the facts in the books were identical, and yet the Houdini that emerged from each book was a completely different person. If they were sitting in a room together, they would have very little to say to each other. Uh, and and these were both biographies. And reading this, I understood with that project that I could never, if, if nonfiction couldn't approximate the, the person who had lived, a creative project could never do it at all either. And so I understood that the pressure on me wasn't to, to make a real historical figure completely and authoritatively inside the book, but to give my version of it, the version that I thought was most convincing, do it in as much research as I could. So that's what I've done with Lampedusa. But in order to do that, I've had to create his interior life. What he thinks, what he feels, what he hopes for, all those things that a biography that's being responsible can't do, that it would be too much supposition. Uh, I'm allowed to just dream it up and try to figure out who he was and why he would spend the, like, the time he had left writing this book. Great question. Anyone else? You're thinking, yes? Could it be beneficial to read the book first and so that so that would help you with early? The question was, should a reader read the leopard first first before they read Stephen's book, Lapidusa? No. <laughs> no, read mine first. No, I um, my publisher no, I'm just kidding. They, they never asked me to say that. I uh, I think if you know the leopard, then this is a really interesting support text. If you don't know The Leopard, I like to think it stands on its own with just a little bit that I set up there or that's on the, the, the dust jacket. Um, my, my, the happiest path would be that you would read my book and then be interested enough to go off and find The Leopard. Uh, but I should say The Leopard uh, is a little, feels a little old-fashioned now when you start reading it, but if you stick with it, it'll start working its spell and it becomes a very strange and beautiful book. Uh, but mine, of course, is written in 2019 for 2019 audiences, so that I think the language is a little bit easier to find inside. Mm. All right. Oh, yes, I think this hand went up first. Uh, he is still alive. Um, he, he wouldn't have been able to read it, no. My question is also for Lynn. Um, you mentioned your uncle. Um, do, you, do you often draw on your uncle's experiences in your book to write your stories? Um, yeah. Usually, uh, the catalyst for a novel is, is sort of some issue I'm, I'm mulling over in, in my personal life. Um, like, for example, the antagonist was, I was, I was talking to Stan Dragon about this the other day because he, he knows this story. The, the antagonist is um, sort of a continuation of Mean Boy in that, oh, this is kind of a long story, but, but anyway, I, I was thinking about um, people getting mad at you for fictionalizing real, people who really lived and putting versions of them in your novel, and that was something that had happened to me. Somebody had gotten mad at me. A few people had gotten mad at me for doing that very thing, and so I started. I started just kind of obsessing on that issue, and the antagonist ended up being about that very thing. It uh, ended up being written by a guy who had seen a version of himself in his friend's novel, become infuriated, and felt like he had to immediately sit down and kind of write the story as it really happened. And through right and through that process, he he discovers that uh, that like fiction is is a thing that's kind of out of control, and storytelling is a, a thing that's sort of out of your own control, um, and and truth and fiction you know sit uneasily side by side. Um, and so with this novel, I think you know part of what made it such a slog for me was I was you know I was I was really thinking a lot about issues of caregiving and growing older and mortality, um, and a lot of that had to do with the fact that my parents were declining, 
and we had always had caregivers around our home because um, because my, my parents looked after my grandparents, which was sort of a very traditional kind of Cape Breton thing to do. And then, uh, and then of course, they looked after my uncle for his whole life until they couldn't anymore, um, which was very recently. Um, and so, my basically, my family was experiencing this this shift into a different phase of life. Um, and I really think that all the anxiety and fear that aroused in me uh, led me to create Trevor because it was like, what, what's what's a metaphor? What's like a big scary metaphor for everything that I'm worried about right now that I can put in this book? And that ended up being Trevor. Mm -hmm. Good question. Anyone else? No? Is that it? Is this it? Is this where we say goodbye, you guys? <laughs> oh, I, I, have, I, have, I have a question. I have a question for them. So, did, does your does your family know um, that Kelly's based on your uncle? And are they uh, have, have they read the book and have they said anything about that? Um, no, it's <laughs> it's kind of weird. Well, I mean, both my parents are are at a phase of life where they they can't really read anymore, um, and usually my mother would be the first one to read my book, but but she can't now. Um, and my brothers have always been sort of terrified of my novel because they're afraid <laughs> that they're going to see themselves in there. Um, so they they take they usually like wait about a year before they venture in and wait to see what the reviews say and stuff like that. So really, nobody has read it yet. Right. I can see how it would be nerve wracking for family. Oh yeah. Like, oh, she wrote another book. <laughs> <laughs> it's a nice way to keep my brothers in terror though because they enjoy that. There was a question back here. Yeah, uh, both for both Lynn and Stephen, could you tell us a little bit about your creative process? And I, I know Lynn, you, you started down that with where you sort of got your idea of ideas for this uh, novel. But can you tell us a little bit about, you know, do you do, you do a story outline and sort of follow that outline along? What, what does your your writing um, day look like? Are you are you are you writing uh, like full time? <coughs> Well, when, when I'm working on the novel, I'm, I'm usually working on it pretty full time. My, my day job is working in television, and um, TV gigs kind of come like rain. <laughs> you know, that you go through dry spells, and then all of a sudden they appear out of nowhere. Um, and so for the last couple of years, it was actually really great to have a novel to turn to whenever the TV gigs dried up. Um, and I would have like these nice chunks of time where I could really devote myself to it. And then I would have to, if, if a job came up, I would just have to be okay with just putting it on the shelf until, until that job was, open, was, was over, because TV work is like, sort of demands everything you have creatively. Um, yeah, so that, my, my process really with this book was, I started out thinking I was writing a short story, and it was just, it was just like a really vague idea I had, and, and the idea was basically Karen coming home, Kelly being there, and then this strange third wheel of Trevor appearing and, and Carrie not knowing quite what to make of him and he being a little bit strange. Um, and then, you know, a hundred pages later, I thought maybe this isn't a short story, maybe, maybe there's something else here. And at that point, I kind of started thinking more structurally in terms of um, an outline. And I started, I started almost, t TV really taught me a lot about structure and so I started kind of structuring it the way I would TV in terms of, you know, it's, it's a suspense novel, which I haven't really written before. But I started thinking about, you know, how, how to make that suspense really tight. And, and it, was, it was outlining and just sort of stopping the writing and thinking about exactly what has to happen in the next few chapters. And uh, that was uh, my process. And Stephen, I'm curious about yours too, especially uh, knowing that you also write poetry. Are you focusing on, on one at a time or are they both sort of there? Um, well, I, I can't I can't do fiction and poetry at the same time, or prose and poetry at the same time. When I was younger, um, when I was starting out, I could, uh, and then the deep, like you know, poetry and fiction are these learned arts, uh, and they're bottomless, and you keep learning all through your years. And uh, when you're starting out, at least when I was, I knew so little about each of them uh, that I could just move back and forth, and they just seemed kind of similar. Uh, poetry just felt a little bit like prose with line breaks. And then 
the more I learned about poetry, the, the, the syntax started to shift and the rhythms of the language started to shift. And the sentences that I write in poetry, if you were to just take out the line breaks and turn it into prose, would be a really dense prose, far too dense to be able to read without being exhausted. Uh, so suddenly I, I found myself having to, literally the, the, the sentences I was building were, were different, I was thinking in a different way. So I, I, I can't do them at the same time. I, I, um, my full-time job is, is um, we have a five-year-old and an eight-year-old at home, so that's my day job. Um, uh, but other than that, I'm, I'm writing. I work during the days. Uh, between dropping the kids off at school and picking them up in the afternoon, we have about five or six hours at home to be writing, uh, and that's our writing time. Um, I don't outline, but I have a very clear idea of sort of something about two-thirds of the way through the novel that I want to move towards. Uh, and then I start moving towards it. And by approaching it, I understand that this is going to have to happen, and this is going to have to happen. And after that point, at the two-thirds point, I don't really know necessarily how the book will end. I find if I know the ending too soon, it loses some kind of um, surprise for me as a writer, and then the, the book starts to it loses some of its liveliness. Uh, so I, I, I don't really panic about not knowing the ending. Unless I hit that two-thirds point, write it, and then I'm like, I don't know where to go now. Then I'll start coming in. And then I can get kind of freaked out. Yeah. But I shouldn't say I don't outline at all, because there's always planning and plotting and drafts and drawings that you do. And after you've written, then you have to go back in and rewrite. And you have to go back in and rewrite again. And each time you're rewriting, part of what you're doing is you're moving lumps of matter around in this manuscript trying to find the right density at various points. Um, uh, because it's all about tension and release. Do either of you want to tell us about what you're working on right now? Uh, nothing. <laughs> I got nothing right now, and it's fine. <laughs> cool. Yeah, I, um, I, I've had a book that I've been trying to work on for about a year, uh, yeah, but it has not been going as well as smoothly as I wanted. I think I, um, I wrote 100 pages into it, single space, so a fair bit of work, and then I stepped back and realized that it's not doing what I needed to do. So I put that aside, and then I wrote another 100 pages in, uh, in a completely different approach, and then I stopped and realized that that is not doing what I needed to do either, just it's going the other way. So I'm hoping that if I can get in between the two of them, maybe I'll find the right way. It's amazing how it's like it's not it's not up to you in a way, you know. It's up to the story, no matter how many hundreds of pages you're putting into it. Well, so, so, stories are smarter than we are. <laughs> well, this has been so much fun, hasn't it? Yes. Been all right. Lynn Cody, Stephen Price, everybody. Thank you guys so much.